Greetings. If I look a little bit like a zombie today, it's because I got an eye infection and it's definitely making me look like a genuine zombie. So my channel now has grown to the point where companies are starting to send me stuff to review. So this video is going to be my first product review. Today we're going to be reviewing this MDPL 1060 electronic load by Miniware. So as I go into this review, I must confess that I'm not going to go into the deep technical details and evaluate the performance of this thing because I don't have a working unit. The first one they sent me had an intermittent failure which made it so that it wouldn't draw any current. But sometimes if I tapped it on the table, it would start working. I opened it up and could poke at the circuit board with a stick and sometimes you poke it in the right place, it would start working again. But I couldn't find the actual problem. So I contacted the company and they were very gracious and they sent me another unit. And here it is but it has exactly the same problem. So I'm gonna focus more on the big picture ideas of product design and where this thing fits in or doesn't fit in in the grand scheme of things. So I've been doing electronic design stuff for more than 45 years and I've never owned an electronic load. In fact, I never really felt the need to own one it just never comes up. Maybe that's because of the kind of design work that I do. But I think if you need an electronic load, chances are you're pretty well up there in the hierarchy of uh, design chops. You're like designing some power supplies or power management stuff. It's not a hobby level thing at all. The only sort of entry level application I could think of for an electronic load is testing rechargeable batteries. For that, I could see it has great utility. In the past, when I've been testing things that need a variable high power load, I'd usually end up making something like this. It's just a board with a bunch of power resistors and toggle switches that allow you to vary the load. Now this one has binary weighted numbers of resistors on it. So the first one is one resistor, and it's two, four, and then eight. So this little setup gives you 16 different levels of load. Very simple and very cheap. While I was doing my research for this video, I looked at all the other electronic load products out there in the market that I could find. So I really wanted to sort of like understand the product design DNA of these things since they are kind of an esoteric rarefied product that not many people buys. They tend to be very sort of cautious in their designs. They, they follow a very similar sort of form factor, control layout, and just general look and feel. And I think that's really for a reason. When I look at this Miniware electronic load, it's a complete departure from the genetic pattern of all the other electronic loads out there. It's as if there was a completely different thought process that led to the creation of this product. So this got me very curious. So I, I actually asked them, I said, do you have some kind of mission statement or masthead that explains the whole philosophy behind your, your products? And they did send me a blurb of text, which I'll share with you. Sniffing around on the internet, I quickly learned that Miniware is a sub-brand of a Chinese company called eDesign. eDesign also bills itself as a product development service provider. In addition to their Miniware line of bespoke engineering test equipment products. They also have a sub-brand called XSearch, which seems to be focused on developing and selling search and rescue technology. Very interesting. Looking at the Miniware marketing materials, things start making a little more sense when I realize that MDP actually stands for Mini Digital Power System. They're trying to create a whole ecosystem of little miniature test equipment that fits and works together as a unified concept. 
The core of the concept is a display module, which unfortunately I did not get. It acts as a control head for all the companion products. I can see that this concept is intended to remove the burden of the user interface from a lot of the sub-modules. This would allow them to be simpler and cheaper and more compact. This whole concept leaves me with a bit of an odd feeling though. It feels somewhat like they're trying to redesign the customer along with the product, as if the needs of the customer were somehow just as malleable as the rest of the concept. It's like redefining electronic design as an on-the-go action sport that requires pocket-sized gadgets that you can quickly shove in your pockets when you have to run. I do appreciate where this idea might come from, but I do feel that it violates the decades-old paradigm of electronic test equipment that we've all come to know and understand. My first reaction when I look at this thing is, it's beautiful. It's really solidly made. It just feels good in your hand. All the finishes on the parts are just exquisite, meticulous attention to detail. Like, look at this expensive CNC metal piece here with this beautiful graphics on it. And dig this crazy grill here, which looks like it's made, it must be photochemically etched. That's not a cheap process. All the graphics are really tight and clean. The little windows, everything just fits perfectly. I mean, it's gorgeous. Now, one of the first things that I experienced when I got this was I realized I had no idea how to turn it on. There's absolutely no indication anywhere, graphically or otherwise, that tells you how to turn it on. It's got this, these buttons here, but does that suggest anything about powering it on? So I actually had to send an email to the manufacturer because I'm lazy and I don't read the manual. And guess what? Nobody does. You shouldn't have to read the manual to figure out how to turn something on. But the secret is you push these two buttons at the same time and it powers up. Okay, that's fine, but why can't there be at least some hint of an idea how to turn it on? It saved me a lot of pain. This product, like pretty much everything these days, contains a rechargeable battery. You charge it by plugging in a USB-C cable into this little socket here, and nothing happens. I'm charging it now, but there's absolutely no indication of anything. There's no LED, there's no nothing on the screen, nothing doesn't beep. How do I know it's charging? Very frustrating, especially if you really need it to be charged. Let's say you're going out on a job and if it's not charged, you're in trouble. That's totally a fail. When I'm working at my bench, ergonomics are really important. I need to be able to see things, I need to be able to get to buttons, I need to have a smooth workflow. So when I'm working with this device, my natural instinct is to turn it and put it into this orientation. That way I can see the display, I can get to the buttons, and I can easily twiddle the main interface knob. The problem with that is, I'm totally blocking the main airflow that's supposed to cool this thing off. It has to be in this orientation so the fans can blow air through it. If it's up like this, it's blocked off and it will rapidly overheat. So besides the unit itself, what's the one thing that you have to interact with the most? Well, it's the test leads. You've got to fiddle with these things to get them hooked up to your device and make use of it. So these things determine to a great degree the level of pleasure or pain you're going to experience. 
So let's have a close look at this. We have basically a banana plug and a clip lead. Now the clip lead part has the traditional little rubber cover on it and it's made out of an incredibly slippery plastic rubber which makes it incredibly difficult to actually squeeze this alligator open without the whole thing spinning because the friction between this rubber boot and the clip lead metal parts is so low that when you squeeze it, it naturally wants to just spin in your fingers. It's, it's very frustrating. So that to me is, is really an annoying feature of this product that would bother me every time I pick it up. So let's look under the hood and see what is going on here. Okay, so at least that's a soldered connection, but there's no strain relief. Every time you bend this thing, you're fatiguing that solder joint and it's gonna crack there very soon and leave you very frustrated. So in general, I think miniware needs to focus a lot more on the small but extremely important details of the user experience. The act of turning the product on and off should be emphasized in the user experience. It's not a trivial thing. It's extremely important. Well, as you can see, it's a very dense product. There's a lot packed in here. Looks like it's very well engineered. The product itself here is extremely small. Does it have to be this small? What if you made it 20% bigger? I think you'd have more room to improve the reliability and robustness, lower costs, and it would have no impact on the user's perception of the product. It doesn't need to be as the size of a pack of cigarettes. Now, I'm always a big fan of simplicity in products. I always think that's a winning strategy, but I do think there's merit to this whole concept of this modular product architecture where you have a user interface unit and a bunch of modular blocks that stack and add functionality. There's a great efficiency to that in terms of reduced cost of goods and ease of use and flexibility. But I think what happened with this product was the mandate that each one of these blocks be a viable standalone product. Now as soon as you do that you have this stew of contradictory requirements. And as you stew those all together, you end up with a muddle that's confusing, inefficient, and overall reduces the value of the whole proposition. The key to winning this is stick to a simple, clean idea and be rigorous about it. Don't be tempted to make it all do everything, because that's how you lose. I do feel like uh, within the design process for this product, not a lot of consideration was made for the legacy of this type of product. There's always an evolutionary process that goes on and there's a lot of wisdom embedded in that process. It's great to come up with a new idea, but don't discard the wisdom of your ancestors. When I unboxed the product and I found these test leads, I was immediately irritated by the way they feel in my hands. And that's a very important part of the user experience because, like I said before, these test leads are a major point of interaction between me and the product. And I honestly had zero expectation that there would even be test leads in the box when I opened it. So in a sense, the company has spent extra money to annoy me as the customer. Think about that. I know I'm gonna get some flack for the opinion I'm about to express, but these days people put rechargeable, non-repairable batteries into almost everything. And it really creates a bad situation in terms of the lifespan of these products. Because we all know that if you look at the components in a product, the battery is the one thing with the clear shortest lifespan 
that basically dooms the product to landfill within three to five years. Now, this electronic load is a perfect example of that. It does not need a battery. This thing would be a perfectly viable product with no battery whatsoever, just a socket to apply power to it. Then it would last for 20 or 30 years, no problem. But the built-in battery is the kiss of death for this thing now. When I'm investing money into uh, electronic test equipment, I often think of this. This thing, my WaveTech Model 191 function generator, this was introduced in 1976. It still works. It's a reliable, solid piece of test gear that I can depend on. That's the kind of stuff I want to invest my money in, not stuff that's junk in three to five years. So if battery power is a must for these things, make it a separate little modular brick so that it's replaceable, so that I know that the hardware that I'm investing in can be used long after this battery brick dies. I can replace the battery brick and it doesn't compromise the value of the products that I bought. Otherwise, I have this uneasy feeling that I'm investing in future landfill. If I was shopping for an electronic load, I would not buy this miniware product. Mostly because it doesn't fit into the traditional test equipment paradigm that would make me feel comfortable. I would look for something that's much more oriented towards real bench top ergonomic operation with a much larger display, you know, larger, more clear user interface, and something you know, that runs on AC power. Just because in my mind, I'm gonna be sitting there all day long, coding, tweaking, testing, and I wanna make sure that my load is, is a smooth and simple part of my workflow. And I just don't feel like the Miniware product really addresses that very well. But I do think there's a huge market if they rebranded this thing as a battery tester. Maybe rewrite the firmware and then remarket it as a battery tester for all those people flying drones, radio controlled airplanes, boats, and cars. Those people have a huge interest in the health and quality of their batteries. And I believe they would be willing to spend money on a very convenient and very portable small product that could do that very effectively. And I think this load would be an absolute smash hit in that marketplace, and that's a big missed opportunity. If I was Miniware, I would immediately pivot and try to market it as that. So once again, thanks for watching, comment, like, and thank you all again.